so this, this actually came out of a fight. It was a very friendly fight. Um, it was years ago now when the, the cast for The Hobbit was, was announced. And, and we had to fight, I always have with my friends, I'm like, why couldn't this be a more diverse cast? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, why don't we always have this, where we're talking about why couldn't there be more diversity? And then the pushback against that whole thing. And the pushback was, well, it's a very British story. It's reflecting British culture and British myths, and it's European. And I just said to him, you know, Lord of the Rings isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if an... Asian Hobbit appeared in a shire and nobody would have cared. Mm. And then after a while I just said, you know what, keep your Hobbit. <laughs> um, which is not a diss on Tolkien because I'm hugely inspired by Tolkien. In fact, there are so many Tolkienisms in the book. Mm. Um, but it made me, it actually sent, that argument actually sent me on a process of self-discovery. Um, it's enough to talk about um, diversity and so on, but even I didn't know a lot about African mythology other than what came over into the colonies. And thinking about fantasy, which I've always, fantasy and, and crime are always, have always been my first loves. In fact, most of the, TV, the films that I thought I saw I actually didn't see. Um, it was a shocker to me when I first saw Empire Strikes Back, because I know everything about that movie. And I realized I did not see this. Mm -hmm. I read this. I read the novelization of it. So even the great sci-fi films, which are a huge part of my vocabulary, it's the novelization of the books I know. I knew very little about um, the ancient African myths and African storytelling. And as soon as I started to really read those and and catch up on the research on it and doing my own work, um, this novel almost started to write itself. And. Um, one and in, in all sorts of ways for one of the one crucial way in which it ha in which that kind of storytelling happened was me letting go of the idea of the kind of heroic narrative that we see in a lot of mm. in, in a lot of fantasy even though they are you know the damsels in my novel are not in distress <laughs> <laughs> at all um you know the vampires in my novel are perfectly fine with daylight so there's no opening of the coffin, they'll just eat you anyway. <laughs> um, so the, the, these really wonderful subversions started to happen and, and, and a story um, started to happen, even though I was still years away from knowing what, what the novel um, was about. But um, thank God for that friend. <laughs> <laughs> Out of a fight to keep uh, nothing far back. Yeah, uh, but it's funny. As much as as much as it sounds like I was reacting to Tolkien, Tolkien ended up being a huge influence on the book. You mentioned there about sort of representation. You mm -hmm. used to read a lot of these books when you were younger, but you didn't see yourself in them. And mm -hmm. so, is it? It's almost like you saying, "Then I will write that book that doesn't exist. I will give that to other people." So yes and no. I mean, I didn't necessarily have a problem with not seeing myself in them. I, you know, I think that's just the reality of a lot of stories. Um, if I were Asian, I would say the same thing. Mm. Um, is, but you do, after a while, start to wonder, well, why can't somebody who looks like me or sounds like me be a part of a heroic ep epic? Mm. You know, in film, where, you know, the wisecracking black guy, I always joke when I'm on trips with my friends, like, just so you know, as the wisecracking black person here, I die last. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, <laughs> the serial killer coming from me last. <laughs> uh, but it highlights the, the, the sort of limited choices that I grew up with and took for, and took for granted. And it's not necessarily a trying to rectify things and make things right so much as, you know, I, I just want to say the dragon too. Mm. Um, you know, we can do something other than saying, that dragon is so big, <laughs> and run off in the other direction. <laughs> So, um, but, but not just slaying dragons and, and, and saving the, the queen and so on, but being a part of complicated narratives, even complicated fantastical narratives. Um, and it's not like this is necessarily something new being done. There are lots of writers, even right now in the African continent who are doing it. There are lots of writers directly inspired by African storytelling like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, mm -hmm. who've always um, done uh, you know, written stories like that. I uh, do believe that you should write the story that you want to read. And you should write the story that you've been looking for to read. And sometimes the reason why you haven't found it is because you're supposed to write it. 
This is going to be a trilogy, and in each of mm -hmm. the books we're going to be focusing on different characters. Right. But in the first book, we're going to be focusing on Tracker. Right. Could you tell us a bit more about them as a character? Yeah, Tracker so doesn't want to do this. <laughs> it's, it's, um, you know, he's a, man, he's a man of very simple pleasures and simple lusts, and, you know, it's just food, money, sex, and off to the next place. Um, so he's nobody's idea of a hero, including his own. Mm. And um, he ends up taking a very simple, a simple um, task, and, and, and it's, you know, it's, that part of the story is pretty much known, I've told everybody. He's supposed to find a, he's supposed to find a child who's been missing three years, and he thinks nothing of it. Um, and the, the novel follows him, so the novel also thinks nothing of it. Uh, until this story starts to get more and more convoluted, and the, the people's stories continue to shift, and people's allegiances start to shift, and this child becomes more and more of an enigma. And at one point, the big question is: Is this child worth saving? Because of what he he turns into, and uh, Tracker, who tries everything possible to have a narrow life, ends up seeing it explode. In his in his face and great things happen great joys happen epic tragedies happen all of this is sort of not what he, he bargained for um, so he's like he's not really anybody's idea of a hero including his own but he ends up being pushed to do things heroic to an extent he becomes a, 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 a better person he would say no <laughs> But it's, um, he ends up being one of the survivors of this sort of great expedition. And he, while he's telling a story, um, part of the device of, of, of the, um, the novel and of the trilogy would be whether you believe him or not. The unreliable mm -hmm. narrator. Well, he thinks he's reliable. <laughs> so... <laughs> And we've seen, with, with something like Black Panther, we've seen how a, a story that is sort of ostensibly told from the African perspective mm -hmm. and has all of those influences can prove to be hugely popular and right. commercially do, do very well. Mm -hmm. Are you hoping, presumably as an author, definitely, but uh, that your books will have a similar wide appeal? What kind of readers would you like to see being attracted to this story? I've always thought that um, one of the reasons why, why Game of Thrones and, um, and Neil Gaiman's books are so successful is, is that as much as we become older and more mature, there's a part of us that always reach for the myths. That's why the myths are still here. Mm. It's why we read Margaret Atwood. And I think that there is an, there's always been an audience. And I think people are also very hungry for stories um, that are unlike their experience. Even Europeans are tired of European mythology. <laughs> um, and so I think there is. I think people are, are, are I hope people are hungry for, for not just different um, stories from different geographical eras, but stories that are told in, in different ways. Um, one of the things that readers should know about this trilogy that, trilogy that I can say is that it's not a part one, part two, part three. You know, it's three witnesses with three very different ideas about what happened, and each witness gets his, gets their own book. Mm. So it is a kind of a sort of a, a reboot, um, which is in, in a way a very African way of telling a story. Um, in, in, in a lot of African storytelling, there's no, this is the authentic story. You're not going to have the director's cut <laughs> edition. <laughs> Although that's a nice idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there is no director's cut. There is... I'm just giving you this story in three ways, which I will tell you over three days, and you have to decide if you ch if which one is true, are all of them true, are none of them true, and um, so I'll, in in with this trilogy, the, the reader does have some work cut out for them. Mm, Marlon, thank you so I'm looking much. Looking forward for you guys reading it. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you.